this is the, the independent, independent, independent filmmaker's guide from Framework Productions. Framework, Framework Productions. How did Netflix go from disrupting how we watch movies to how we pay our talent? How are these negotiations so historically different than before? And what do Soylent Green and Silicon Chips have in common? Hey everyone, and welcome to the Independent Filmmaker's Guide. I'm your host, Matt Mundy, and again, we want to talk to you today about this historic strike where SAG-AFTRA has joined the WGA and explore some more things to help us understand how we got here and help us see where we might be going. Last time, we began talking about the difference between the AMPTP and independent producers and how, during this strike, the offerings of interim agreements to these independent producers are uh, actually ramping up pressure on the AMPTP to come back to the negotiating table and keep collateral damage inside the industry at a minimum in the meantime. Oh, and just a quick side note on that, uh, that these agreements are just that. They are not waivers, but rather actual contracts, signed agreements between the union and independent producers, where waivers excuse a party from rules that apply to others, interim agreements actually bind parties together to rules. These two words are not interchangeable, although much of the press seems to think so, but that can be a topic for another time. Today, we wanted to talk a little bit more about what the AMPTP actually looks like right now and how different some of these agendas are and why uh, for each of its members. Basically, my thoughts on answering the first two questions, how Netflix changed the AMPTP, and thus how these negotiations have been changed by that. In broad terms, the alliance is basically made up of studios, broadcast companies, and tech companies, but I'll be lumping studios and broadcast together for what I'm referring to as the traditional makeup of the AMPTP, while putting the tech companies together as the innovative makeup. This is in order to easily, well, hopefully more easily, lay out how these parties, even before coming together to the negotiating table as the AMPTP, their own internal agendas are existentially different and at times even opposed uh, to one another. They're in opposite directions. Now, you can already imagine what this does to the priorities and expectations when they do come to the table with the union. But first, there is one member of the AMPTP that probably sits squarely in the middle of your mind when thinking of the traditional and innovative parties. Netflix. Yes, on the outside it looks like a sleeker traditional member in that it produces, distributes, and exhibits TV and movies. But Netflix was built from the ground up as a tech company. So while looking like a sleeker traditional member, it's behaving as one of the innovators. So let's get into it. Netflix was founded in 1997, the same year as a certain, at the time, online bookseller, Amazon. And just a few years after the bursting of what is now referred to as the dot-com bubble, a giant meltdown on Wall Street when internet companies that were all valuation and no substance crashed to the ground. As a result, it'd be easy to dismiss companies in this sector as potential big players in the days soon after. Heck, Netflix tried to buy Blockbuster in 2002 for just $50 million. And three years later, in 2005, DVD sales even peaked at $16 billion, or 64% of the home video market. But something was shifting in the expectation from shareholders of tech companies. Among other things, two things happened almost simultaneously which changed the game. First, was shareholders started showing that they were okay with less than stellar quarterly reports so long as a company was growing, and growing fast. And one such company to prove this was Amazon, a tech company focused on its future growth and expansion, even at the purposeful expense of profitability. Second, Netflix was positioning itself similarly as a growth-oriented company, and they were doing this selling one thing, a bundled word for TV and movies, content. So, where Amazon was growing with innovation and the acquiring of companies almost becoming synonymous with online shopping, 
Netflix's singular focus on their one product led their innovation to be the ability to take at the time their licensed TV shows and movies and undercut the more traditional media companies with incredibly cheap subscription prices. And Netflix grew so quickly that shareholders again were patient and rewarding of such growth. Not to mention that Netflix had something over Amazon's growth. Netflix was already profitable. So, let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Netflix had created a model that ostensibly undercut all their traditional broadcast competitors so that they could grow in subscriptions as quickly as possible. This aggressive focus mimicked startup tech growth companies. Meanwhile, leading up to this, stockholders had just basically told Amazon in the tech field they were more forgiving for a company that didn't show profitability as long as it showed massive growth. And eventually, Netflix's growth was indeed massive. Okay, moving on. This obviously revolutionized the way television and film were both consumed and then later thought of. On top of this, Netflix was beginning to fully control what it produced and how it was distributed and how and where and when it was exhibited. This turns our focus back to the more traditional media companies. In 1948, the case of the U.S. versus Paramount Pictures, known as the Paramount Consent Decrees, basically barred companies from legally owning all the making, distributing, and exhibiting or showing of movies. It was an antitrust breakup of motion picture production and ex exhibition companies. Now, as a side note, four consequences of all this, by the way, was the rise of what I'll call the independence. Independent movie theaters, uh, a proliferation for the next 30, 40 years, independent art houses, independent film for talent and crew, and for us here at IFG, independent producers and studios. So, against this backdrop, where the traditional companies are held to this decision in 1948, Netflix is able to do what they can't, and members of the AMPTP could not. No wonder cords were being cut so quickly. Now, on top of all of this, other tech companies were starting to offer things that look like this. Amazon, leveraging its prime membership to offer TV and movies. Apple is another, leveraging its brand to do the same. But examples like this are just a fraction of these companies' actual profits and revenue. Uh, showing how uh, these companies are simply using TV and movies as an extra touch point for consumers to actually buy their cash cow products, uh, be it an iPhone or a myriad of items with two-day shipping or even AWS. Again, in the center is Netflix doing just one thing, 100% of its portfolio, and doing it exceedingly well and outside the system. So, these innovative companies are undercutting traditional media so well with customers fleeing gr with such rapidity that these traditional companies attempt to rebrand in order to either stave off the bleeding or simply create a new market and stranglehold their content libraries back. The easiest way to see this was the original edition of the plus sign after the company's name, uh, kind of reminiscent of companies putting dot com after theirs back in the day. <laughs> Maybe that should have been a sign. Anyway, they started literally streamlining their products, deciding to put all their chips on the table and try to undercut one another. Problem is, though, these actions were not simply rebranding. This was significantly changing their business models overnight. Ad-supported business models, profitability business models, models that were so entrenched in our everyday lives that it's easy to not even see how television and car ads, uh, remember General Motors Presents, have been hand-in-hand -hand since the very beginning. And even posited as one of the reasons TV developed its own season cycle. Yeah, it was to highlight the selling of cars. Yeah, mostly ad-based and profitability models trying to shake things up. In other words, they were not tech companies from the ground up, but rather trying to retrofit themselves as such. And I position that when we hear of money being lost today, part of what's not being said is the realization that this is actually part of the fallout of not recognizing this incompatibility when they put all their chips in. So, 
You know why video on Zoom works so much better than Microsoft Teams or Google Meets? Because Zoom was built from the ground up for video. The others, it was just an add-on, and in some cases, incompatible. Netflix was built from the ground up for this streaming. Okay, so getting back to how all this comes together to existentially change the character and makeup of the AMPTP, and therefore its negotiation expectations with the union. Because up to this point, Netflix wasn't even a member of the AMPTP. That's right. In 2019, Netflix becomes a member of the AMPTP and gets a seat at the table to start voicing negotiations for labor conditions and residuals. A sleek growth company spending tons of money and the owner of the ability to vertically integrate all aspects of production to the consumer directly. But remember, these other traditional companies were held under the Paramount Consent Decrees in 1948. That is, until a year later, after Netflix became a member of the AMPTP. In 2020, the federal court terminates the Paramount Consent Decrees. In short, granting those more traditional companies access to vertical integration, basically helping them to at least look like they could now compete with Netflix, all while coming to the table to negotiate with the union. On one side, you now have a fractured voice by a collection of companies, some of whom are tech and some who just look like tech, and each with very different shareholder expectations. And on the other, a unified voice that cannot pretend to be based on anything other than what it is. Talent. Finite numbers of talent. Laborers. Well, just us. People. We can start to see why these negotiations look so historically different than all the other ones before. And so, a race to the bottom is sped up. Look at the goals. You have tech companies who just want to amass products and grow, grow, grow. Chips getting faster and faster and smaller and smaller and more efficient. Then you have traditional broadcast companies that have tried to change lanes or change their stripes, but without silicon chips to put to work. Ah, but they do have people. And they are asking them to get faster and faster, smaller and smaller and more efficient. This is literally what they have to convert in order to truly go from looking like a tech company to become one. If Soylent Green was people, now it's people who are silicon chips. Now we can start to understand their natural proposals for AI and our what you talking about Willis revulsion of the idea. On another note, which deserves its own rabbit hole, but at least to touch on it here, as we've seen in the trade papers online and uh, in talk in the news amidst all this upheaval, is the revealed fact that since 1978, CEO's compensation has grown by over 13 1,800%. Heck, the S&P has been about 800%, which already pales in comparison to the 1,300%. And all this, while typical labor, has grown just 18% in that same time. I mention this specifically to understand that as the union comes to the table with the AMPTP, seeing eye to eye on any negotiation must start with a recognition of income inequality. So what do we do with all this? And I'm not saying I can propose an idea that'll make this work. I'm just laying out some of the challenges that lay ahead, and like I said earlier, to give us some context of how we got here in order to inform our conversations. From rethinking how labor is treated to how labor can be related to the shareholder, I mean, that is part of negotiations we used to call residuals. But again, Tech companies never had to work in that way before. So maybe the more traditional side of the AMPTP should be informing those companies about that old relationship, rather than the other way around. We are labor. We are creative. We are essential. 
Now, I talked last week a little bit about the importance of the strike, as well as the definition of and the importance of independent film, how independent filmmakers not having a seat at the table have been given an opportunity to continue to work with those interim agreements I mentioned because of SAG's understanding of who the strike is really against, the AMPTP. And as someone who is both a performer and a producer, it only highlights the importance of us as the labor, as the artists, of making our own work, having these interim agreements. These literally keep the pressure on AMPTP members. And like I said, it minimizes the collateral damage inherent in any strike. And this type of collaboration also helps to show the members of the AMPTP who is really being unreasonable. And when you have a thriving independent filmmaking scene, you start to see not just more stories being told, more people working, but more people working with dignity. And dignity is a lot of what this is about. And who knows this better than the storytellers? So many of the stories we want to tell center around or focus on dignity and sometimes the loss of it. So let us continue to stand strong for our dignity and the dignity of our work and the dignity of the stories we want to tell. For more information about this and how to support, go to sagafterstrike.org. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Independent Filmmaker's Guide. Filmmaking is a collaborative experience, as is this podcast. So be sure to follow us on Instagram at Framework underscore Productions. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to IFG wherever you get your podcasts. But no matter where you do listen, if you could also rate and review us on Apple Podcasts specifically, that really is one of the best ways to broaden, strengthen our community, as well as just helping us make these episodes better. Speaking of, if there's something you'd like for us to cover on a future episode, we are now on Discord. Just look in the show notes for more. IFG, how movies get made.